Hi, my name is Clinton, and today I'm going to explain to you the rules of a game called So Long Sucker. So Long Sucker was developed by Nobel Prize winning economist and mathematician John Nash and his colleagues in 1950 as a way to illustrate and investigate some of the behavioral theories they were looking at, specifically how people form coalitions and how your behavior today changes depending on how you expect other people to behave in the future. This is an area of study we now call game theory, and it has become very, very prominent in the field of economics. So Long Sucker is a simple game with relatively simple rules and components, but it relies on the interaction of the players, making coalitions, making promises to behave a certain way in the future, making deals, and fundamentally breaking them to give really an interactive game, one filled with intrigue, uh, with betrayals, and one that really relies on the interaction of individual players more than a complicated board or setup. The goal of the game is to be the last person standing to eliminate all the other three players and be the sole player in the end at the table. The game is played with a relatively simple set of components. However, it isn't available as a box set in retail. So what you've got to do is really uh, forage around and get the supplies yourself, which isn't too difficult because, as I said, they're relatively simple. So to play the game, you're going to have to find four sets of different colored chips with eight chips in each set. We usually use large poker chips, which are readily available and work very well. A cup or bowl in which to discard chips that are killed or eliminated. A six-sided die, or any other die you have, it's optional, but useful. And these are all the components you'll need to play the game. The setup involves giving each player seven chips of their unique color. We'll call these chips their supply, and then giving each player an additional non-playable eighth chip of the same color to sit next to them so all other players remember what each person's starting color is. We'll also place the bowl for killed chips on the table and determine the starting player randomly, in this case by rolling that six-sided dice, with the highest player starting. But you can really use any random method that you want for choosing the starting player. Once the game is set up, the starting player will make the first move, and it's pretty simple. They're going to take one chip out of their supply and put it in the center of the table. Then they choose who goes next and that can be any of the remaining three players. After this first turn, things are a little more complicated, and each turn will follow three simple steps. I'll go over those now. First, you're going to play a chip to the center of the table. Second, you're going to determine if there's a capture, and if there is, resolve that. And third, you're going to determine the next player to make a move. So in this case, let's say red chose blue to go next, Blue would take one chip from the supply and put it in the center of the table. They could either put it directly on the table or they could play on top of a pre-existing chip making a stack. There's no limit to the number of chips that can be played directly on the table. That's always an option. And fundamentally, you can also keep adding to stacks as well. Once someone plays, you then determine if a capture was made. A capture is when two chips of the same color are played sequentially on any one stack. So for example, if it was now red's turn and they played on this stack, two red chips have been played sequentially on this stack, which means a capture occurs. Let's resolve the capture. What you do is you look at which player's starting color initiated the capture, in this case red, red chips were played to initiate the capture, so red will benefit from the capture. Red will take this entire stack and move it to their area, and then they'll choose one of these chips to eliminate from the game forever by placing it in the kill jar. We'll say they choose white in this case. Then they take the rest of the stack that they captured and they can add it to their playable supply. It doesn't matter that there's a green chip in there. They'll be able to keep that and use it just as their own throughout the game. The only difference is if you have a color that's not your own in your supply, we call that a prisoner. 
And they have a few benefits that we'll go over in the future. But for now, you can just put them in your supply and play with them. That's how you resolve a capture. After a capture is resolved, or if no capture occurs, you then go to step three, which is determining the next player. If a capture did occur, then whoever benefited from the capture, in this case that was red, becomes the next player. If no capture occurred, then whoever played the last chip to the center of the table gets to determine who goes next, following a few simple rules. If the person had played directly onto the table surface, then they can choose any of the other three players to go next. However, if they played on a pre-existing stack, then they may not choose a player whose color is already represented in that stack to go next. So in this case, green played on this stack, blue is already there, red is already there, so green may not choose those two players, meaning it must be white that goes next. So if you play on a stack with other players' colors in it, you can't choose them to go next. Okay, but what happens if all the colors are in that stack? Let's say white plays here. All four colors are in that stack. Who's going to go next? In that case, you choose the color that is furthest down in the stack to go. In this case, red is represented furthest down. So after white plays, red would have to go next. A uh, couple qualifiers on that. It's not necessarily furthest down overall. For instance, if the stack was like this, we have white, green, red, blue, red. While red is furthest down, the first blue chip to come is further down than the first red, so blue would go next. So uh, just to clarify what I said there, it's not necessarily the chip that is at the very bottom that would go, but the first chip that is furthest down of that color in the stack. In this case, the first blue chip is further down than white, green, red, so blue would have to go next. That's how you determine turn order. After that, the next person would take their turn and go through their three steps. Now, a couple things to give you some insight on, um, and that is specifically right now the idea of a prisoner. We talk about how a prisoner can be a chip of another color that sits in your supply. So you get those by doing captures and moving chips into your supply, and often they can be other colors because other players had chips in the stack you captured. When that happens, you get these prisoners. In this case, red has a green and a blue prisoner, and they have a couple features that regular chips don't have, specifically the following. At any point in the game, meaning on your turn, on another player's turn, in between turns, when people are making, I don't know, are just negotiating about some kind of deal, uh, if you don't like the way someone looks at you, at any point in time, you can decide to kill one of your prisoners, meaning you tuck it in the kill jar and eliminate it from the game. Why does that matter? Well, let's say I had a green chip here, and the green player wasn't really agreeing to something I liked. I'd say, green player, I want you to try and capture the stack for me next time, and, and they don't want to. I could say, well, because of that, I'm going to just kill your chip. Then that's bad for green. So it can be a way of enforcing um, authority or uh, just really kind of bullying someone. Conversely, at any point in time, you can take a prisoner and you can give it to someone else. So I can give this to white player at any point in time, maybe to secure a move in the future, maybe so they'll do something for me right now, maybe just so they'll like me more uh, later in the game. Those are all options. So prisoners can at any time be given to someone else or be eliminated from the game, essentially killed off. You can't do those things with your chips of your starting color, only with prisoners. That's especially important because if at some point in the game, red, for instance, has no playable chips left, sorry, that should stay as the starting color indicator, they have no playable chips in their supply, and the turn comes to them, they would normally be eliminated. But knowing what prisoners can do, red could appeal to the other players that have a prisoner, in this case, white and green, and say, hey, white, if you give me that blue chip so I can play it, uh, I'll uh, play however you want for the rest of the game just to help you out and pay you back. And in that case, white could go, okay, I'll give you that chip. 
Red can play it as part of their turn and they're not eliminated. So prisoners in that sense become very powerful because they can stop someone from being eliminated from the game entirely. A couple other things just to go over because they can lead to some confusion and controversy. So I'll try and clarify them ahead of time. The first, again, is just about capturing. Remember, it's not necessarily the player who plays the chip that benefits from the capture. It's going to be the player whose color is used to initiate the capture that benefits from it. To specifically illustrate this, if it was Red's turn and Red had a green chip as a prisoner in their stack, they could initiate a capture using it. In this case, Red isn't going to benefit from it. Green will. Even though Red has played it, Green will take the stack. Green will be the one to determine which chip is eliminated in the kill jar, and green will then get all these chips and get to put them in their playable supply. So remember with captures, just because you played the chip doesn't necessarily mean you'll benefit from the capture. And again, with captures, whoever benefits from it will take the next turn. So in our little scenario here, green would benefit from it, green will also go next. Secondly, when a player is eliminated, let's say red is eliminated, they're chips that are held by other people and that are on the table in the game, stay in the game and are treated normally. Meaning that this guy green here can keep playing with his red chips or her red chips uh, just as they did before. But the difference is the chips on the table of that color of the eliminated person are no longer used to determine turn order. So in this case, if a red chip was present in a stack here and blue played on it, it doesn't matter that there's a red chip there. A red chip will never be the next person to play. It's as if it wasn't there. Anytime a player is eliminated, the chips stay in the game, but they're no longer used to determine turn order. Finally, if a person is eliminated and their chips are used to initiate a capture. So in this case, we have a stack. Green uses a captured red, initiates a capture with it. Well, normally, Red would benefit from this capture because they are the starting color that was used to initiate the capture. However, red is eliminated. So that means this whole stack is killed. If you initiate a capture with a color chip of a person who's eliminated from the game, that whole stack is thrown out, is eliminated from the game. Green would then have the turn again. And that's the game. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you're all still friends when you're done.